What up, Get Up Nation? My name is Ben Biddick, the host of the Get Up Nation podcast and co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player and CEO of Lurong Living, Adam Greenberg. Make sure you pick up a copy of the book if you or someone you know needs to get up after being knocked down by life's challenges. Make sure you check out the podcast website at getupnationpodcast.com. Subscribe with your email address so you can connect with us and contribute to the nation that is built upon serving others, gratitude for the gift of now, and intervening in pain processes to create liberation through consciousness, resilience, and perseverance. It is an honor to share this present moment with you. Comment and reply with where you are joining us. We would love to see and hear who you are, what you're doing, and what you're up against. Let's work together to overcome our challenges and live our finest lives. Today, I have the honor and privilege of speaking with Jordan Lindell. I recently discovered Jordan as a result of a post on the We Are Survivors Instagram feed. This feed is at weare.survivors. It's a nonprofit organization that shares the journeys of those battling cancer in order to serve as hope for others. You can also support them by going to survivorstore.org to purchase apparel, jewelry, and other gifts. On January 23rd, 2018, We Are Survivors posted a photo of Jordan with her fist held high, her beautiful newborn child nestled against her, and a smile bright as dawn lighting up a hospital room she was in. The caption under the image reads, I did it, I am strong. Get Up Nation is honored that Jordan has taken time out to share the story behind this image. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Jordan, you were diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma 30 weeks into your pregnancy. Can you share with us your experience of learning about the tumor? I have a two and a half year old son named Lucas, and we were ecstatic to find out we were pregnant again and had a you know uncomplicated pregnancy. And right after Halloween, about 27 weeks into my pregnancy, I just started with this cough didn't really go away, but a cough in early November didn't really pose much of a, a worry in my mind. My OB put me on some cough medication, didn't really go away. She then put me on an antibiotic. Again, it didn't go away. And saw other doctors during this time. They said, okay, you're pregnant. It's just the weather. And then the day my family was celebrating Thanksgiving, a couple of days after actual Thanksgiving, I woke up to find a lymph node around my left clavicle swollen. Called my OB. Again, she wasn't really worried, maybe thinking this had turned into pneumonia. But she had called the ER locally around us and said, why don't you go in and get a chest x-ray and we'll see what's going on. So I walk in and get the chest x-ray and the doctor comes in and says, okay, I see a little bit of fluid in your lung, but there's a little bit of cloudiness. I want to get a CAT scan. And of course, you know, here I am pregnant, not wanting to get a CAT scan, but ultimately deciding that that's best. And as soon as I got back, my husband and I were, you know, joking and talking and fully anticipating to go back to the Thanksgiving party. And I'll never forget, I was in the hospital bed, obviously. My husband was sitting next to me. And as soon as the doctor came in, I knew that something was going on. I mean, I'm a hospice nurse. I've seen that face many times among care providers. And uh, this, I could be wrong, but this ER doctor seemed young, so it seemed like the first time, (laughs) possibly, that this doctor would have to deliver bad news. And she closed the curtain behind her, whereas before she'd just, you know, swing in and out. She somberly closed the curtain, sat next to me and said, you know what, Jordan, this, this isn't really an infection that we're seeing. And so the next words out of my mouth were, so I have cancer. And it's just like, I don't know what made me, like, immediately recognized what was going on. I mean, my only symptom was a cough, but my husband said, I never, I was anticipating her being, oh, stop, it's just maybe like a fungal infection. It's it's another type of infection. And she just looked at me and she goes, well, it could be that or it could be a germ cell tumor. And um, our hearts, you know, of course dropped. I mean, I'm holding my belly of this precious little baby inside and I was you never think that you have cancer and so I said well how big is it because I'm thinking if it's a germ cell tumor and it's small maybe it's something you know not necessarily worried about so she showed it to me and it's pretty much taking up my entire chest it's 14 by 10 by 12 centimeters so in inches that's like a four by six inch picture in my chest that's also five inches thick so uh, I called my OB and she immediately came and we talked and cried together and just that love of 
what happens next. And I, I'll never forget, too, um, I dropped my two-year-old off at our family's Thanksgiving party. And in anticipation of, you know, coming right back and the fact that he's a toddler and was already um, playing with the toys, uh, I just kind of, like, waved goodbye to him. And I said, I love you, buddy. I'll be back soon. But knowing now, <laughs> it's like you would want to hold him and cherish them for, like, 30 minutes before going through that. But, you know, um, we that was how we found out. <laughs> that led to a number of procedures. Um, it sounds like there was a, a lymph node removal and a port placement. Yes. So I immediately, this was a Saturday that I went to um, find out about the tumor. And on Sunday, I had a needle biopsy, which anyone that knows the hospital knows the fact that they called in someone to do that procedure and that it was done on the weekend kind of speaks volumes of how critical this was. Now, the needle was just a small, tiny aspiration of some of the um, tissue, and it came back inconclusive. So within a very short period, I was in an operating room in pre-op, and I discussed with the surgeon, I said, what are my chances of being able to do this completely awake? And he said, oh, the sedation won't harm the baby. And I said, no, I don't care. I want to be awake. I I'm going to have to go through so much. I don't want to put this precious child in any danger if I can control it. If I have a high pain tolerance, can I do it? And he said, "Uh, we can try. We can do it. So I was in my first ever surgery was the lymph node removal. The local numbing helped. And any time I felt something other than uh, more than I should, I was able and conscious to ask for more, and I did. But uh, that procedure, the hardest part to get over other than just the fact that surgery was being performed on me and I was awake, was the cauterization. So that's when they cut, you bleed, they have to burn that off, and it was smelling my own flesh. Now, if you think of where the, where the lymph node was, was right where my clavicle was. And your clavicle is pretty close to your nose. <laughs> so wow. the fact that wow. I was smelling my, my own flesh burning for about an hour was, uh, was something to... Uh, mentally prepare myself for and but what was beautiful at the same time was I was going through a surgery my first surgery I was scared and you know you can't have loved ones typically in the room with you that's where the waiting room is but I got to have a loved one with me the entire time I got to have my baby so um, yeah they had um, they were monitoring baby the whole time there were monitors on my belly and I remember them saying we can turn this down if it's bothering you and I said no I won't want you to turn it up. I loved hearing the heartbeat the whole time and it wasn't a somber like I was afraid I'd be crying. It was it wasn't a somber procedure. In fact the surgical resident that was scrubbing in recently got engaged. So we were talking about that and talking I mean we got we got through and then the next day got the results that it was ninety percent certainty Hodgkin's lymphoma and typically they would put in a pick line and the surgeon came in, the same surgeon, and he said, you're a rock star, this first one. I'm confident we can just put the port in. And I said, you know, a lot of the nurses are saying, I'm proud of you for doing the lymph node with while awake, but the port is a whole other story. Do you think I can do it? He goes, oh, yeah, without, a, without any question or doubt, I think you can do this. So the very next day, um, go down for a procedure, and this one was a little bit more challenging. The first procedure was in a uh, full-blown operating room. This was a room probably half the size on a surgical table about half the size. I didn't know that they take you and they um, they had a pillow underneath my hip because I shouldn't be flat on my back with the baby. They had um, straps there where they tied down my arms so I couldn't physically move my body. And then they tipped the table to where I was um, backwards, kind of like a headstand for a good 40 minutes. And wow. because of where the port is on my chest, the surgical tarp um, had to be laying completely flat over my face and couldn't be moved. So uh, I didn't know I was claustrophobic until that moment. Wow. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. <laughs> so the um, challenging part with that was I could feel with how the port is, it has to be tunneled into your skin. So in order for that to happen, I felt the pressure of uh, the surgeon's finger tunneling into my skin for the port. But again, made it through. Babies did fine throughout both procedures. And 
I was proud with the little control that I could have in that situation that I was able to do it awake. Were you able to hear the heartbeat of the child through that procedure as well? They monitored the baby through that procedure since it was, um, I guess, less of a risk. They monitored before and after. So what a relief coming through surgery to um, hear the baby's heartbeat after um, post-op. So, And that was a little bit of an ordeal because when I was tipped backwards, baby went breech. So baby wasn't responding on the tests how they had hoped. Mm. And so that was um, another trial to get through. They did more ultrasounds the next day, and it showed that just that flip that the baby did was the reason for the response and that everything was fine. So you also received a couple of chemo treatments. Correct. So I was, I had the port placed and the very next day that night um, I had my first chemo. Uh, They say chemo is like a uh, boxing match. You get knocked down the first time, you bounce right back up. Get knocked down subsequent times, it's a little bit harder to get back up. Uh, Mm -hmm. So the first treatment other than just being exhausted, doctors coming in, lack of sleep, I made it through. But um, the second one was more challenging. And obviously, anytime you go through the after effects of chemo, adding a pregnancy and being pregnant on top of that makes it all the more challenging. I didn't want to eat, and I had to eat for two. Um, I had fatigue issues, and yet I had to get my behind up and move for two. <laughs> so. Mm. and be a mom for my older child and the wife and fulfilling all those roles all at the same time while still trying to comprehend that, you know, I I got my first chemo treatment less than a week after finding out about the tumor, which is unfathomable in modern healthcare. Typically, you go through appointments, you go through testing, but it was just such a whirlwind that I was being identified as a cancer patient before my even recognition of my of that being my true identity, of that being myself. So then you endured all of this and the moment came and you delivered via induction at 34 weeks. Is that right? Yes. Um, I went in Christmas night for a scheduled induction. That was our goal. My doctor didn't want me to go past 34 weeks and that was 34 weeks exactly. So I remember walking into the hospital room. I had a winter hat on to, so the nurse didn't know that I had you know, shaved head and a hospital mask on. And I'll never forget, she turned to me and said, do you have a cold or something? I said, no, I just have cancer. <laughs> so that was how our rapport started off. <laughs> then, um, and then the process with the induction is a, a medication called Cervidil was put into the cervix, softens it, and then the plan was for a Pitocin to be started about eight hours later to start the contraction. But when the Cervidil was placed, I immediately felt the same kind of labor pains that I felt with my first child. And I told the nurse this, and she did not believe me. You know, using the evidence that she had, she's looking at the monitors, which are supposed to pick up contractions, never did. And my belly was never hard, always soft. And I said, I'm telling you, I'm having contractions. So after three hours, my doctor, of me being in pain, my doctor said, I don't want you in pain anymore. I'm making you get that epidural. That was our agreement to not stress out my body with this huge mass in my chest. And uh, an hour after that epidural was placed, I felt a pressure. And the nurse checked me, and I was nine centimeters. Now, mind you, not a single contraction was picked up on the monitor. Still didn't believe that I was having them. And then I told my husband, I said, you better get your camera because I have a feeling that something's about to happen. So she calls the doctor in. She says, I'll put your head of your bed down. We'll make it. The doctor will be here. And four minutes later, I said, I feel sliding, and the head was halfway out. Wow. Now, when you're told, wow. yes, when you're told that you have cancer, told you're going to deliver your baby, told you're going to deliver your baby that's otherwise healthy as a preemie, you have to trust the doctors that, you know, they said, oh, Nick, you staff will be in the room. Everyone will be in the room making sure that you guys are okay. And it was just two nurses that delivered the baby. And by wow. by a miracle, baby was breathing, baby was fine. Um, we taped it as a family. Just my mom had her had my cell phone, and we taped it. And I love watching it because I was looking at my husband the whole time, you know, worried, wow. panicked, what's going on. And he was such a strength in saying, "It's okay. God has this. We'll be okay." And um, upon watching the video. 
the second time, the third time, the fourth time. I can see the nuances of him secretly panicking. He's biting his lips. He's clenching his fist. Mm. But mm. he held that strength for me, which was nice to see. And I felt bad for my OB because she was the one that kind of took the reins. She's the one that called my oncologist. She's the one that prepared all this. She's, she was heading everything of my care, and she didn't get the – pleasure of being able to deliver my baby for me so but we made it through elijah was born we waited all that time to find out the gender amongst all the ultrasounds amongst all the opportunities to find out we named our baby boy elijah which means miracle worker minutes after delivery there were you know 20 people in the room most of which i'm sure other than looking at me maybe could tell that i had cancer but didn't know the situation and uh baby was health enough healthy enough to have skin to skin so baby was on my chest at this point and uh my husband was taking pictures and I said I'm sorry if this is too much for anyone but I explained my story and I threw my hand up in the air and I said I deserve this picture I did it I'm strong and I'm a mom so everyone was like cheering and clapping and it was such a beautiful moment of like, uh, the summation of everything, like out of cancer, out of this diagnosis, I brought life into the world and what a blessing that is. Wow. On the Instagram post you wrote, a cancer diagnosis often brings a suffering that is hard to fathom, but as we lose our bodies and physical beings, we get to explore what truly makes us who we are. As a result of of this, Jordan, what have you learned about what makes you who you are? So much more than the than the day to day. It's so much more than the I don't even know. It's, it's the fact that I'm a mom. It's the fact that I'm a wife. It's the fact that I'm a fighter. You know, you don't really know how truly like of a fighter personality you are until you're placed in that situation. And I'm one that doesn't give up. Um, I'm a truly faith-based individual. I believe in God and the amount of what I call God incidents through this entire thing has just been amazing. I mean, how can this precious child go through two chemos and be in the NICU for a week and never need oxygen? How can, I mean, how can a simple cough lead to discovering cancer and discovering um, the uh, the ability to fight this and win and the fact that we've had so much love and outpouring from multiple states and, you know, through social media and just the love and support that we've received. Um, I look in the mirror and I've always had like a, a physical build, played volleyball my whole life, a very athletic I mean, seeing your body waste away makes you realize that it isn't the outward that matters. It's what's inside. And, I mean, dang, my spirit and my soul and my heart, those are those can't be depleted. If anything, they've grown. If there are other people facing a similar diagnosis or adversity during their pregnancy, Is there anything about your journey that you would like to share with these men and women who may be listening? Definitely. And actually, you know, through the outpouring of the same social media post, I've recently been connected with a group on Facebook of just that moms that have gone through this exact journey that I have. And we're support for each other, but just in any pregnancy, I mean, don't give up. I mean, cling to God, cling to your family, cling to Every, I mean, you are strong. You are able. You can get through anything. Every person is walking through a challenge in life. Life isn't about the challenge. It's about what you make of it. And, I mean, not everything in life is good. Not everything in life is perfect. But that still doesn't mean that there isn't good in every situation. Every day that you wake up and have breath in your lungs, it's for a purpose. You also have another child, and you continue to battle to be healthy for yourself and your family today. Is there anything that any listeners can do for you and your family to help? Oh, gosh. I mean, 
take my story and make any day that you think is bad a little bit better. Take my story and pray. I mean, just self-reflection is huge. Um, you know, I, I have since had uh, further CAT scans. The mass is shrinking. I've uh, I've had setbacks, you know, as with any journey. One of my chemo drugs developed a toxic reaction in my lungs, and I had about 20% lung function and was in the hospital for a week. But, you know, you get through that. You move on. Each day is a new day. And, I mean, the outpouring of support that I've already received has been phenomenal. But I always welcome prayer and would love to have people pray for me and my family. Is there anything else you would like to share with us that we haven't talked about? No, I mean, I definitely appreciate your um reaching out to me, and I hope that my story can be one that inspires others, uplifts others, gives others hope that, you know, even out of the darkest times can come a precious moment in life. Amazing. I have six questions I ask all my guests to help us gain a deeper level of understanding of what makes phenomenal people achieve these amazing things. Do you mind if I ask you these six questions? Not at all. Okay, who are you thankful for today? I'm thankful for God and my family. What are you thankful for today? Another day to be one step closer to being cancer-free. How do you fuel the fire within you? (sighs) Each day I begin with prayer and I begin by devotion and specifically a Hope Through Cancer devotional, and it um, seems to speak to me exactly when I need it. So that's when I feel the fires. After those two moments of how do I prepare my day mentally and how do I get my strength, that's where I get it from. And then um, when I kiss my husband and kiss my kids. And then what was one thing adversity taught you to value? It's funny because it taught me to value my past, all the good memories that I've had that may have taken for granted. And then upon reflection and your hope for the future, any future memories that I can make. Um, Elijah turned a month old yesterday and I cried so many happy tears because that is one milestone that can never be taken away. (laughs) What are you doing today you never thought you could Not many people get to stare at a life-threatening battle face-to-face, and I get to do that every day, and I get to say, this will not defeat me, which is pretty amazing. (laughs) And what will you do tomorrow that you never thought you could? What I'll do tomorrow that I never thought I could. I'm getting my energy back slowly but surely after the lung toxicity, so I'm going to keep pushing myself every day to be stronger because right now, you know, my legs are pretty weak, my feet are numb from the chemo, but I will still continue to take one step at a time into this battle. Hmm. Jordan, it has been an absolute honor hearing your voice, sharing your journey with all of us. We honor you. We admire you and are wishing you and your family the very best of life and health. Um, If there is anything that Get Up Nation can do to help you and your family, please don't hesitate to ask us. We will mobilize whatever we can. I just can't say enough how much I appreciate you being willing to share this journey with us. Thank you so much for including me. What I love about this world are the warrior heroes who accept the constant changes and unknowns of life and who bravely and ferociously allow their love to guide them. Today we honor Jordan Lindell who created life out of the darkness of cancer, who welcomed a miracle worker into this world and who is a great light to those who are afraid especially during pregnancy and childbirth. 
Thank you, Jordan, for your bravery, your strength, and your example. May you make 100,000 more memories with your husband, Lucas, Elijah, and those who will learn from your journey and take comfort in your voice. Be well.